The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. You can't buy time, but you can save it. The advisor portal at MLC Life Insurance is just one way we're helping advisors streamline the advice process. Using the advice portal, advisors can generate quick quotes and indicative underwriting decisions in one place. This means less time spent on paperwork and more time focused on clients. To learn more about the MLC Life Insurance Advisor Portal and how it will save you time, visit our website or contact your distribution representative. Hello, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I'm James Wrigley. I've got the pleasure of speaking with with Max and I'm going to get him to pronounce his surname in a second because we are just saying before I'm going to completely butcher it. But but Max from CBD Advisory, how do we say your surname? Hi, James. Uh, great to be here. Uh, it's Mashkivsky. You I blame you for... for uh... Uh, being fearful of butchering it, it is quite long. It's about fourteen letters, and yes, well, the Ukraine—that's why it's so long. Yeah, all right. So, look, thanks for thanks for joining me today for the podcast. We the, the angle that we're going to take with with this, and we'll see where the conversation flows, is is is, uh, is around this kind of career career change into financial advice. Max, you, you, know, you as much as you're an advisor now, you you weren't in financial advice to begin with, and then I think. Lots of people will have seen, certainly people in, in the industry will have seen a lot of the press around the number of advisors that have left the industry, increasing demand for financial advice and and certainly one way that, that businesses or, or at least the, the industry or profession at large can can look to try and do something about that is yeah. is trying to get people like you to do a career change from wherever they might have been before into into financial advice. So maybe Max, tell us a little bit about what you're up to at the moment. So you're an advisor with CBD Advisory. Tell us a bit about CBD Advisory and you know and, and, and what you're up to at the moment. Yeah, so so we're a, a family uh, family practice. Uh, it was founded by uh, the director Terry Panagiris back I think 30 years ago. He's he's been he's been the sole uh, yeah, director of the company, and then uh, his daughter is now the general manager, and the two of them have this wonderful team together. Uh, and I came in about three years ago. How how big's the how big's the team? Yeah, so the team is we have about 10 people on shore, three yep. advisors. I was. I'm the fourth now. We have one advisor on maternity leave, so three at the moment in the office, and then we have three uh, staff members overseas. As well. Yeah. Okay. And where's where are they based from? Oh, probably in the Philippines. In the Philippines. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Right. Uh, and we service around about three five hundred clients, and uh, we're holistic advisors as well. So yeah. Well, yeah. insurance. Any any particular demographic of clients, particular niche, or anything like that? Not really. We're quite open to so so really this this service offering is. Is divided into three segments. Um, accumulators are the ones that I typically look after. So people who are you know, 25, 35, just starting out their financial journey, usually high incomes, low assets, and we help them grow. Grow their asset base, invest their money appropriately, get some cover in place to protect them, make sure their estate plans are, are getting done as well. Uh, the, the senior advisor looks after you know slightly older demographic typically, and then uh, Terry usually looks after high net worth clients, those that are just nearing retirement, um, you know, peak of their asset base, and he helps them to transition to that retirement journey. Gotcha. And 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 yeah, it's kind of three distinct demographics of clients, and and three sound like kind of three you know three advisors doing different things with different different people. How do that? And and you might not have experienced it just yet, but do you, is is the idea that as someone moves through that journey, they go from another you know, 25 to 35 year age bracket to the next one and to the next one as they go through those three different stages that they would move on to a different advisor or would you work with that group of clients and as you get older and they get older, you you, you know, start to work with them differently and then eventually start to work with them you know, differently again when they're 60 and retired? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think at the moment that divide is more reflective of where the current stage of the business is and the current client base is. So, those clients that have been with Terry historically you know, for 25, 30 years, they're more accustomed to working with him. So that's that's the clients that he would look after. And it just so happens to be that they are 
larger balance and a certain set of needs that may not be the same for clients that, that you know, 25, 35 years old. And yes, the idea, I think, is, as you rightly said, would be for, the, for me to work with those clients over the years and then um, transition them to uh, continue looking after them for a long time and then as their needs change, be able to accommodate for them. So no, essentially, we don't want to make sure... We- we want to make sure we work with the same group of clients and we're the same face that they see, and they're familiar with us, uh, because there's a certain level of coaching and comfort that, that goes hand in hand with, with giving good advice. And we, we kind of want to make sure that that stays across. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's a pretty long standing business. I, you know, I don't know the stats in the financial advice space, but, but I wouldn't imagine there's too many businesses that have been around for the best part of nearly 30 years in really? financial advice. Has it always been a financial advice business? Correct. Um, I do. I do remember distinctly Terry saying that they used to do mortgage broking at some point yep. in the past. Yep. Um, but over the last 10, 15 years at least, it has been just financial advice. Yeah. Right. Yep. And yeah, you, you're, you're probably right. It is. A, it's quite a fragmented industry, uh, and, and you would yeah, you would find a lot of businesses that have been around for as long as we have. Yeah. I, I reckon. I reckon you'd probably find. More commonly, there's accounting businesses that have been around for that long, and the accounting business might also offer financial advice services. But, but if it, if it's just a financial advice mortgage broking business, really without that that accounting element to it, I would I dare say there's probably not too many businesses that have been around for, for that long. So, obviously, doing something right if uh, yeah. if they've been around for that long, that's fantastic. Now, as I said at the start, we we wanted to spend a, a fair chunk of the the podcast today just talking about this idea of a career change. So. Whilst you're working financial advice at the moment, you said you've been there for nearly three years, is that what you said? Yeah, so I've been with CVD Advisor for three years. Yep. I've been on an advisor for about a year. Yep. And so what were you doing what were you doing prior to working in financial advice? Like you you, you look young. How how old are you? I'm twenty six. Twenty six. Yep. Okay. So so take us through your your earlier journey, you know, finished school, uni, whatever, you know, tell tell us that bit of story and, and, and where you're working in in the beginning. Sure, absolutely. So I, I went to high school, finished uh, year 12, and then went straight to university. So that would be around 18, 19. Uh, I did a four-year commerce degree at University of New South Wales. It's not the usual degree. Usually, commerce degree is about three years. Mine yes. was longer because uh, I had some work experience included as part of, my, part of my degree. Now, my degree was in accounting and finance. A lot of the people I was, was around at that time you know, they really saw their future career as being one of three things. You know, you're either a best banker, a lawyer, or a failure. <laughs> really, it was this mentality of, you know, I have to get into banking, I have to get into asset management. That was the top tier sort of uh, high performance culture, that high performance, high return culture that all these young aspiring professionals wanted to be in. Um, and, I, and I sort of did follow that, that trend. I went to management consulting straight out of university. Um, so I finished a four-year degree and I went into a top-tier US firm and I worked there for two years. Uh, and that's what I did you know, before I, I joined the, the financial uh, advisory game. Uh, I did, however, know about financial advice beforehand. I did an, a small internship with an advisor back at uni. Hey, you're right. so, uh, if it wasn't for that experience and that exposure, to be honest, I wouldn't have had a clue that this industry yeah. exists. Uh, and there's these tailwinds in place that makes this industry so lucrative. Yeah, and so that that... That, that placement internship that you did, was, was that part of your kind of one-year work experience that you did as part of the, the yeah. degree or was that something that you did over and above the requirements of the degree? It was just over and above, actually. Yeah, it okay. was by, by sheer coincidence that uh, essentially it was a colleague of my, of my dad's that had a financial advisor that he spoke very highly of. He said, you know, Max isn't doing anything over the summer. Why don't you go in and have a chat to so-and-so and, uh, and see if he can give you a couple of weeks of work experience. So I went out to Parramatta and uh, I worked with this financial advisor named George, wonderful guy. I think he's still in the industry as well. And uh, he just, over the over a two-week course, just gave me a really good exposure to what he does day to day. Oh, fantastic! And so, what what you, what were you doing in the, in those couple of weeks? So what what ended up happening was um, essentially I was his little, basically his associate for, for for those two weeks, right? Yeah. Now he he runs a relatively established practice, and again, I haven't spoken quite some time, but this was. Uh, this was the case back when I was there, uh, and he, he runs an established practice, and all he did was just have me involved in, in reviewing a couple of clients, essentially. Yep. And while he was developing his strategy for those clients, he said, well, why don't you go away and, and then see if you can come up with a strategy of some sort. See, see what you think we should do for these clients. And then I'd spend the majority of my day Googling things, trying to find out information, you know, 
learning things about uh, personal financial management at the get-go because I had no education back then in that area. But essentially, I'd come back and say, this is what I think. And he said, oh, well, 80% of what I think is the same, but hey, have you considered these 20, 20 things? And um, and he, we know, he, he just sort of educate me on sort of little details that I was missing that practitioners would know. But it was just a really good way of understanding it and getting good experience and to have pragmatic helping people manage their finances really is. It's not that foreign. It's not aeronautical engineering. It's actually quite straightforward. And uh, most people can can you know, really help out just by, by having basic knowledge. And that's fantastic. And so you, you didn't do any financial planning subjects as part of your communist degree? No. It was very, it was corporate finance. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I did one, <clears throat> I did one financial planning subject as part of my degree and, and, uh, I, I don't recall doing terribly well. I passed it. I know that I definitely passed it, but I wouldn't say it was one of my better better subjects. I had no idea what it was all about. I remember I just remember being in some lecture at some yeah. guy came Cairo girl, I don't know. There was someone that I remember came in a suit and stood yeah. in the front. They were a practicing financial advisor and spoke about something. I had to try and learn about this super system. Yeah. And anyway, here, right, here, here I am working in financial advice. So so what was the so you worked a, a couple of years in, in, in management consulting. what was the what was the, the, the turning point for you to say, actually, you know, this, this financial advice stuff that I spent two weeks doing an internship s- seems like maybe something that I want to want to you know spend a bit a bit more time in here. What was the turning point there? What happened? Mm. So really, it was a it was a turning point. It, there were there were two driving factors really. What pushed me out of consulting and what pushed me into financial advice. Uh, what pushed me out of consulting was, um, I suppose, the the work life balance. It's it's quite a uh, a, a challenging industry to to maintain a work life balance in, and the exposure to certain industries wasn't there. And this was a lot of a lot a lot of this is to do with the uh, with the type of work that your your firm is contracted to do. So really, it's, it's out of your control. Um, you're allocated to a project, you're allocated to an industry, and you sort of stick there and get uh, and get the work done. So that wasn't very appealing to me. And given I have a finance background, I wanted a bit exposure in that finance sector, right? But also what pushed me out was the fact that I was helping these multi-billion dollar conglomerates make a little bit more money. Yeah. I put an extra number at the, at the bottom line on a P&L. And really, I, I didn't feel like that satisfaction was there in terms of actually seeing tangible benefits for people. Um, because at the end of the day, the employees in these companies that we would consult to, they'd still get their pay. Uh, the, the senior executive manager might get a bit bigger bonus, but really it wouldn't wouldn't make much of a change to their life. And, and you never got that satisfaction for putting in crazy hours of work. And and finally, uh, as a migrant to, to this country, I, I was involved quite intimately in, in my parents' finances. So basically, uh, they didn't speak English very well. They, they weren't financially astute. So I, I did a lot of that uh, financial management for them. And I, I did feel like it's something that I was quite good at and enjoyed doing. And you saw that if, if you were just armed with basic facts and knowledge, you could help people uh, with with their financial position, uh, sure. you could help them negotiating things with the bank, with a utilities company, with a telco, uh, and I wanted to apply that to my everyday. Essentially. So, what other industry allows you to do that, but also keep that client interaction, that pro- level of professionalism, educate people, and get that reward and satisfaction, and keep a work life balance? Because let's face it, it, it is a it is a big selling point in my, my personal opinion as a young person, and. Um, Long story short, I um, I reached out to Sir Angela, who's the general manager here, and uh, she said, "Well, why don't you come in and we we have a chat and see if you could uh, be an associate for Terry." Yeah, and so yes, yeah, so I'm interested in how to that. So you see, so you'd come to this conclusion that you know the management consulting wasn't for you. That 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 nah, you're helping make some massive company a, f- a few more dollars, and and maybe it kind of it sounds like you got a bit more satisfaction from actually seeing the benefit that you're making or you could make in the financial advice space with the individual person. And at the end, the end person that's benefiting from your advice is the person that's sitting in front of you. Uh, how did the, yeah, how did, how did you then go about finding somewhere somewhere to go and and what was your experience in, you know, you, you, you had a job and you had a couple of years work experience, not, nothing terribly much in financial advice. But how did you go in terms of making that jump was it just the first place that you spoke to? Did you have to speak to a few different places? Like how did how did you end up with the job that you've got now? Yeah, it's a great question. I suppose the the first thing I'll answer is how, how would I you know, how would you go about getting a job in, in this industry if you don't have a lot of experience? And then the only thing I'd say to that is there are a lot of skills that are very transferable from management consulting into financial advice. Uh, a lot of skills. In fact, it's a very similar job. It's client facing. 
And there's a lot of, um, there's, there's some technical elements that you need, but a lot of them are to do with how you present information to people, whether it's written or verbal. And those were the skills I relied on when I was doing my interviews to essentially compensate for the fact that I had very little work experience. I knew about the industry. I did some research on it. I knew the tailwinds that were happening. Uh, and this was around about the time when the Royal Commission was, was just wrapping up. It was the aftermath, you know, in the, um, the, this, the scarred battlefield of, of advice and advisors leaving in hordes. It was, it was quite a bad time to get into the industry. But, you know, and nonetheless, I saw the, the writing on the wall that a lot of practitioners would leave. There's these attractive tailwinds. The demand is still there, if anything, it's, it's going on. So the fact that I did my homework, the fact that I had those skills, the fact that I, uh, you know, I could speak well and speak to clients was what got me across the line, I believe. In terms of research, I did speak to a few firms. Uh, the CBD advisory guys that, that I did end up joining were very attractive. Firstly, geographically, I, I'm, I lived nearby. Uh, secondly, I, I knew about them. I did reach out. I knew about the family that ran this business, and they spoke very highly. They were spoken of very highly, so yes. I knew I was going to, to a good place. And it was a family business and small, and then those were the things that I was sort of looking for. Yeah, right. And 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 so you you, know, you did an interview of sorts with them. Yeah. They offered you a job to, to come on as an associate. And so how long did you spend doing that that job of an associate? And and how was the learning curve for you in, in that role? Yeah, I, I spent a year in, in that particular role. So what ended up happening was uh, essentially I, I just came in at the right time. So Terry was the principal of the business. I was looking for a Actually, sorry, he did have an associate at that point in time. I was working for the, a different advisor for three months. And then the associate that Terry was uh, working with, he left. And so there was an opportunity to work with essentially the principal business. Uh, I did that role for 12 months. Uh, and in nine of those months, I was doing my grad diploma. Okay. Grad diploma with Kaplan. Uh, I had to do, uh, I think, seven out of the eight units, but I did all eight anyway. And it's possible to actually overlap them a little bit with Kaplan. So they have five semesters, I believe, or five whatever we call it, yeah. uh, study periods. Yep. And you, could, I did two subject uh, in the second, third, and fourth and fifth uh, study periods. So it's pretty full on, full time yeah, job and, and doing two extra subjects, two, two subjects two subjects at a time. I was looking to make full time work and studying two subjects per, per study period, but I did manage to get get through it. And uh, commerce degree obviously helped. It's not essential, but if you if you don't have that finance background, you will find yourself spending a lot more time. Doing the, the study, I had a lot of that background in place to, to sort of help me. And I did that for, for 12 months and got my grad diploma around about December of 2021. Yep. yep. Good on you. And so, yeah, this is what's going to be one of my one of my questions to you around the around kind of bridging that education piece. You, you had an accounting finance degree, and so so that that's helpful. You know, I, I, I get from time to time people reaching out to me saying, oh, I know this financial advice stuff. I see some of your videos. It looks really interesting. Uh, how do, you know, how do I kind of get into the space? And and, and my, my t- typical response back to them is actually look at the education pathway that you need to take first off because depending on what you've done in the you know, previously, you might have to do a whole lot of study or maybe you only have to do a, a tiny little bit. So it sounds like in your case, because of the degree that you had that and that would have got you a long way towards the current education standards that are, that are required. Yep. And then you just had to do the grad the graduate diploma to to kind of bridge to bridge the gap. Have you done any other study other than that? Have you had to do anything else? All I did after so I mean I did a CFA level one back when I was at uni. Yeah, right. that was more of a extracurricular activity because I was but for life. So <laughs> that's I nuts. Who does fair. that? Who does that as extracurricular? No, I mean, to be fair, I did want to, I did see myself going into equity research at some point. Yeah, yeah. Um and, and that's why because CFA is a very well known accreditation in that area. I'm glad I didn't though, but it was just a really good wrap up of my finance degree. Yeah. Very challenging, but uh, I would say also very rewarding if anyone out there wants to challenge themselves and has a fifteen hundred dollar uh, you know Fifteen hundred dollars lying around, then that's something that you should look into because it is really good. Um, so I did have that, and I did also do three subjects to master's degree, financial planning, which I haven't finished yet. I have to do my fourth. Good idea. But no other study. Yep. And and, and to, to what you mentioned before in relation to bridging that gap, I'd say a lot of people in this country, young people, do commerce degrees or you know commerce or business degrees or sub sorts. And I find that if you want to get into financial planning, having done that finance degree or commerce degree or business degree, it's a very, very small gap to bridge. 
a lot of skills and a lot of knowledge is very transferable. I mean, ethics and, and certain specificities in terms of super environment and stuff that do need to be learned, but it's, it's really not much. Yeah. I, um, I, so I didn't, I didn't know about this whole world of extra, extra studying it with, and I did, I did a commerce degree as well. I'm, I'm a 10 years older than you, a bit, a bit over 10 years older than you, but I, I did a commerce degree way back when as well. And, and I had my first job, but then I was looking for other jobs, and it wasn't until I sat with a recruitment agent, and they said to me, "Oh, what other what other studying have you done?" And I said, "What do you mean, what other studying have I done? I've done my commerce degree. Can I can I just get a job now?" And she's like, "No, <laughs> you know, you, everyone, as you just pointed out, lots of people do a commerce or a business degree. Yeah, you need to look to do some of these extra things through the likes of Kaplan, and so you know, I did a Kaplan. That, yeah. That's what got me into a Kaplan course, and then." And then he just eventually ended up going down the financial planning path. Uh, didn't didn't realise, and and now with the financial planning industry, there's there's you know much stricter education requirements that are pushing people down that path anyway. Previously, you didn't really need it so much. So you, you, I guess if you had any had any tips for anyone that's considering a career change, whether it's from management consulting or anywhere else, what what would you what would you suggest that they do? Where, where should they start if they're considering a uh, a career change? Yeah, great question. The first thing I did, and uh, my consulting background didn't kind of help me with it, is analyze the industry extensively, right? So if you have a job somewhere and you're earning a living, that's great, but you're thinking of changing, before you make any move, I would do a lot of due diligence. And that's what I did with financial planning. And I basically sat down, did a whole bunch of research, talked to, to some people that I knew within the street to understand if this is an industry that's, that's attractive to go into. Right, because there's a whole lot of effort and risk that you need to take to change jobs, to change industries, and that effort has to be worthwhile. So I did my research. I found that the number of practitioners is falling in the industry quite rapidly. I think it's now halved from its peak. While demand is still high and demand is going to go up, there's this enormous transition of wealth. Younger people are becoming more aware of their finance needs and the lack of education in it. So there's this enormous demand that advisors fill up. So I said, listen, this is a great time to get it. At the same time, the regulations peaking, educational requirements seem to have stabilized because they were changing it quite, quite rapidly at that one time. This is great. Oh, and I like talking to people. I like helping people. I have a finance background. So all those things are kind of you know pluses for me, green flags. And that's what, what really sold the job to me. And it, was in that, it was enormous risk. I mean, I took a massive pay cut. I think I took close to two and a half time pay cut. Right? So I went from from six digits to, to two digit salary. Um, and I said that was worthwhile because in the long run, I saw myself staying in the industry and then that pay cut being worthwhile in the, in the long run. So to anyone looking to change industries, I'd say the financial advice is a great industry to move into, especially if you like talking to people, uh, if you like helping people, uh, if you enjoy finance and numbers, but not, not too extreme. I mean, you don't do crazy calculations and, and models of Excel, but nonetheless, you do need to be at least friendly with numbers because people do rely on that uh, and you do help to plug that technical gap. And uh, if you do enjoy all those things, this is a great industry to be in, but do your research uh, and make sure that you're clear on the education requirements, as you said, because they can be quite onerous or if you have a background or a degree in, in the relevant field, they could be quite light and quite quickly you'll find yourself being a PY advisor and becoming an advisor and helping people. And then it's interesting you <clears throat> you I was going to follow up and you and you just touched on it then too is also also the kind of the, the reality of, of of changing careers and and I've spoken to to others that have wanted to get into financial advice and they had somewhat established careers in whatever that they were doing to be to in you know at the moment there's the reality of the salary drop to say when you eventually become an advisor and you progress and so forth you may very well be earning the same if not more as where you're coming from but but if you're going into a brand new industry, you kind of have to go backwards to a to a to a degree, go into some some form of a more entry level type role before you can do your studies and uh, le- you know learn on the job and so forth, and then your salary starts to go back up again as you as you move forward. And so you need to uh, prepare yourself and position yourself for that. And so uh, if you're young and living at home and so forth, maybe a, a, a drop in the pay cut isn't. Isn't quite such a big deal, but if you're, you know, got a mortgage and family, and you know other people relying on you earning a particular income, then that can then that can be a, an, an an issue. And and you, 
things. You just really just need to prepare for it. I guess it's financial. You know, you do some financial planning on your on your own, on your own, on your own self to say, okay, well, if I'm salary's going to drop, I need to have this much money in the bank so that we can get by for a period of time before uh, before we start moving on. And that falls into that due diligence. So, you know, your point that I raised just on the quick side. I mean, you, you need to be aware that there are some industries paying very high salaries, and entry level jobs in this industry don't necessarily pay that well. And if you do, if you've done the due diligence, you'll be aware of that. And as you said, uh, I'd, I'd do it earlier rather than later. I was quite young when I moved. I did live at home, and that did make it feasible for me to take that pay cut for a year or two. So, so what's next for you? Like you're incredibly well spoken, and you know you've done tons of research by the sounds of things on on the space. What's what's next for you? Where do you see the opportunities for for financial advice and 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 for yourself personally? Yeah, it's. A- Correct question. Um, so for me, I say the, the thing with this industry as well is I find that um, unlike a lot of other industries which have a very clear and very rigid and, and long hierarchy, this industry doesn't really. You sort of tap out a financial advisor and you can't really become a you know super high senior financial advisor. You're just a financial advisor and really that job, although it looks different across the, the industry, it's, it's pretty much the same in terms of what the skills you need are, what you really do. So really- it's about building yourself, building a name for yourself in the industry, and um, making people see you as a, as a reliable, technically competent practitioner. And you build networks around yourself uh, for people to be referred to you, and you refer to, to others. So I'm talking about like accountants and solicitors, uh, and really we do say that an advisor is a conduit person. So you speak to an advisor, and if an advisor thinks they need an accountant, they'll refer to you one. They if they think you need a solicitor, they'll refer you to one, um, and and you really become this this, this central node for a person's financial well being, connecting with all these other practitioners. So, in terms of what I want to do, I just want to be firstly, I want to service the clients that I'm looking after now very well. I want them to know me. I want them to feel comfortable with me, uh, and really grow that relationship. Terry always told me that being a financial advisor is like a, is being a therapist in a suit, really, because a lot of this job is is that emotional intelligence, being able to talk to people, uh, being able to support them. And a lot of the time, it's just a conversation. Hey, how are you doing? How are things? How's your family? How are your grandkids? What, any travel you've got planned? And you sort of weave finance into it. Oh, you're planning to go on. Or we call it in the next year. Cool. We might need to withdraw some money. I think I'll do it like this. Anyway, keep telling me about your your plans and how's retirement treating. Yeah. So I think you can always become a better practitioner. You can always learn to do that better. Uh, it doesn't mean just because you're a financial advisor and you can't progress that your learning stops. You have to keep learning in this industry. That's another great thing about it. You have to learn because it's mandated, but you also should learn because there's a lot of interesting ways to acquire information and a lot of ways that you can continue growing yourself as a person. Really. Yeah. And then you, you're right in, the, in that that you and you work through an associate advisor and so forth, and you become a financial advisor, and you look to try and become a better and better financial advisor, and and you never stop learning. Um, but then, for for some people, not not all, then then it becomes this idea of trying to build a build a team or build a business, build you know, build build some some scale around you, and whether you do that in in the current business, and this isn't just necessarily a conversation with you. It's just just in general, is there's whether you try to do that. Uh, around you, or you go off and you, and you and you do it on your own. You know, I've gone down the path of I'm a, I am a part owner of the business that I work in, a, a small part owner of it. But rather than go out and do my own thing, James Wrigley from scratch, it's kind of building a team and 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 growing within the business, uh, so that then you take on more of a more of a management type role of a of a team of people. And you're responsible for their own career progression and so forth. That's the bit that they, they now starts to give me a lot of satisfaction. And you get to a point where you you do a really good job with your clients, and it sounds like you're well and truly on that path. And then and then and then look for what's going to kind of stimulate you and keep you engaged and, and so forth going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think you know once you do your clients right, uh, well, once you do right by your clients, everything else falls in place. Uh, who you work for, how you work for, as a sole proprietor or as part of a bigger company, um, whether you're an advisor or a director, doesn't really matter. If you do right by people. And your name gets out there, and there's a good green flag, big green flag up against your name. Then, um, then your name will be well known. People yeah. will flock to you and look for you for guidance. Look to you for guidance. Do you and 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 you you might not have built enough of a profile in in the financial advice space just yet, but but do you ever 
get get you know a younger people talking to you about career change or what's it like in financial advice or anything like that? Have you, have you gone to that? Because I reckon you'd be you'd be fantastic at it. But have have you have you had that opportunity to just, just not yet? really, not really. Um, yeah, and, and that truth be told, I think I should also put myself out there, and make myself better known to to people who may be considering that move, and, and make myself available to them. Um, I did have the pleasure of speaking to some people from Ensemble who, who, who have a dedicated board specifically for this, which I think is great. Yeah. By the way, if, if you're listening to the CMA, yeah. well, Ensemble is great. It's all almost like a LinkedIn for, for advisors, and there's a dedicated space in it for young advisors and people looking to transition into this industry. And there's questions that could be posted and questions that could be answered. And um, I just think it's a great place for me to start doing that due diligence because. Instead of you going and Googling a whole bunch of stuff about this industry, go and speak to people who are in it. Ask questions. That's it. Join the Ensemble community. There's a there's a few in there. I was speaking to someone a couple of weeks ago that's um that's come over from South Africa and, and the whole thing that that sparked his journey into financial advice in Australia was a couple of posts on the Ensemble platform there. Really? So um yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with you with your comments there. And maybe this, you know, doing this podcast, thanks for coming on, but maybe this podcast is the first of you Putting yourself out there a little bit more and, and building a bit of a name for you for yourself, um, Max. Look, thank you for for joining me this morning. It's been a pleasure to get to know you. Uh, as I said before, highly well spoken. I think uh, CBD advisor is onto a winner picking you up. Good on them. Have to, um, thank you, I reckon you might have people beating your door down trying to get you to go and work for them in time. I would be surprised. Kind of, and yeah, if anyone listening to this podcast has any questions, please you know, feel free to reach out. That's James and myself, and I'll be happy to, to give you some more information. Yeah, well, um, in the in the show notes and you know, wherever people might be listening to this from, we'll put some links as to where people can find you on LinkedIn or, or wherever else if they uh, if they want to have a chat. Mm-hmm. As I said, Max, thanks for joining me. Pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, James. <laughs>